I've heard over recent years that being sore doesn't necessarily mean you had a great workout. Like, what are your thoughts on that? So I think the the claim that being that that being sore means you didn't have a great workout is categorically false in essentially every case, because when your muscles have delayed onset muscular soreness, that means you went above and beyond their proximate ability to maintain tissue integrity, and they needed the immune system to come in and rearchitect the muscle and heal it all broken inside. That's what soreness is. Now, does that mean your goal every time has to be soreness? No. Is it even true to say that maximum soreness equals maximum gains? No, it means maximum stimulus driven to the muscle, but that much stimulus can make so much damage that your body fixes the damage half the time or all the time and doesn't even get to growing you much or at all. So it's definitely such a thing as being too sore, but if you are getting sore, you're definitely stimulating the muscle robustly. And that's a good thing to know if you're not making gains. So for example, if your shoulders never get sore, but you're making great gains on your shoulder strength and size, no problem. Nobody asked, nobody answered. Keep doing what you're doing. But if your so- shoulders never get sore and you're really struggling to put on shoulder size, you have to ask yourself the philosophical question of, am I training my shoulders hard enough? And someone could say like, well, are you getting sore? Like, no. Well, how do you know you're going hard enough? At some level of difficulty, at some level of intra-session stimulus magnitude, most people will experience delayed onset muscle soreness in that muscle. And that may even be too much, but it sure is not, not enough. So if someone's like, Dan, and eight sets of squats make me sore as hell, I know something about them that's very, very unique and very special and very useful. It's that for them, eight sets of squats is at least enough to cause a robust stimulus. And so doing more is probably not a good idea. Here's how I use this in context. Someone tells me, look, man, like I'm really having trouble bringing up my glutes. I go, okay, when you train your glutes, do they get sore? They're like, yep, every single time. And I, are you recovered for your next workout? They're like, yep, just barely, then recovered, then I'm training. Anything I'm going to tell them after that is not going to be to try to improve the stimulus side of the equation. It's going to be trying to improve the recovery side of the equation. You got to eat more. How much are you eating? Like, well, I really haven't gained weight in a few months. How do you expect your glutes to grow if you physically don't provide raw materials, right? Like if you're building a skyscraper in New York and the port authorities, like you can't import any new materials. You're like, I don't care how long the workers are working. They're not building anything. There's no materials here. But I sure wouldn't tell them like, hey, listen, like you got to go harder. Harder? but they're already getting sore and they're barely recovering. Any attempt at going harder is just interfering more and more with hypertrophy because it's causing so much damage. It's just counterproductive. So soreness is a real good way to see that you're for sure doing enough. For that, it's great. And if you are experiencing poor gains in a muscle, your nutrition is dialed in, recovery is dialed in, and you seem to be like, I think, I think I'm not doing enough and you haven't gotten sore yet, up you go, slowly increase your volume over time, see if you can get sore, at least really fatigued, and you'll probably catch some growth along the way. If you're not getting sore, but your progress is really great, don't worry about soreness. It, it probably wouldn't benefit you a ton to do more because you're already getting great results. Just keep doing what you're doing. So you've said a couple of things, like when it comes to like, if people aren't seeing results, it's, it's likely a factor of this. They're not, you know, working out intensely enough. They're not eating enough. They're not recovering enough. What do you say, like, generally speaking, like, if you if you pulled like 100 of the people who have come to you over the years, like, what is it typically that they're not doing in the gym? Is it intensity? Consistency by a long shot. People will say, I've been training for four weeks. Like, I'm usually on and off. I haven't trained in eight weeks and really I want to improve my chest. I'm like, this is nice. Come to me when you've trained regularly for a year. And if they do, they're like, hey, my chest gains have been great. I'm like, that's right. Training consistently makes your chest get bigger, you know, like that's a big one Um, in the gym. There's tons of ones outside the gym that I could talk about, but in the gym, that's a big one. Another one is very, very bad exercise selection um, or or really, really bad technique. So some people want bigger legs, but they're unwilling to squat leg press or hack squat deep. And like, yeah, it's really hard to grow your legs if you only half squat. You have to do double the volume and it beats up your back and you might still get not so great gains. So that's a big problem. Uh, and then, you know, the, uh, so the technique one is bad. Uh, and, the, and then, of course, you know, some people think that some exercises are definitely really good for a muscle group when, in fact, they're not that great. So they'll do sumo squats halfway down for the glutes. 
and their glutes aren't growing much. Well, there are movements that are way better for your glutes, like the front foot elevated lunge is just way more stimulative for your glutes than that exercise. So a lot of times the exercises they're choosing aren't exactly the ones that challenge the muscle uh, enough. And obviously in, in some people, it's a matter of effort. And in many people, it's a matter of volume. And by effort, I mean like they're just not pushing every set really that, that close to failure. And there's a volume question of like, you know, like your muscles could recover from 30 work sets. Uh, your biceps could recover from 30 working sets per week, but you're doing 10. And for some people, their genetics are such that they don't grow very well unless they do much more volume. And then so for them doing more like 15 or 20 or 25 sets, they'd see better gains. But a lot of them try that and they're like, but that's a lot of work. And I'm like, well, you were never entitled to being super jacked, unfortunately, that God did not sign for that package in your case. So you're going to have to earn it. Um, I will say, though, maybe tragically or whatever it is, two other things I have to mention. And I have to mention it would be nice maybe for your for your listeners to hear. A lot of times, the kind of gains people want are just limited by their genetics and their age. I mean, you know, I've had many times 48-year-old women come to me and uh, they're like, I want like a bikini body with like even more muscle than a bikini athlete. And it turns out their genetics just aren't that great for building muscle. Obviously, they're females, their hormonal environment's not ideal at all for building muscle. The 48 years old, they have some pre-existing injuries. Their body's not as responsive as it used to be. And so all of a sudden, they're not in a position to be gaining a lot of muscle to begin with. And a lot of these folks... They're smart, very well-meaning, very diligent folks. And they go, okay, this must be the secret that I'm missing that's not allowing me to get jacked. And they'll point to a 26-year-old bikini competitor on steroids in a magazine or in an Instagram post and be like, how do I look like her? Well, you know, Karen, there is no real path for your genetics at 48 years old to get there. So a lot of times uh, when people don't get the results they want, sometimes it's a good idea to come back and see if it, their aspirations are grounded in any bit of realism. And the best way I talk about getting results is do a reasonable program that gets you some level of results. And then just try to keep getting that kind of, that order of magnitude of result. Like for example, if you put on five pounds of muscle in half a year and burned off three pounds of fat, try for the next multiple six month sprints to put on a couple pounds of muscle and burn off a couple pounds of fat. That's realistic, right? Like if you if you threw a punch into one of those punch machines and it said like 600 pounds per square inch, whatever, right? You could be like, Mike, how do I train to get to 900? Same order of magnitude, same scale. I could be like, yeah, that's reasonable, right? But if you're like, how do I punch at 6,000 PSI? I'd be like, dude, are you out of your mind? Do you like get your robot arm? Maybe. Like that's crazy that some people will kind of get these gains consistently and single digit pounds of fat burned and muscle gains per year. And then they'll come to you and say, I want 15 pounds of fat off my body and I want to gain 10 pounds of muscle. And you're like, but you've been gaining two and three, 10, like not a miracle worker. And a lot of times that's when a kind of a more close association with reality kind of discussion has to happen. You know what I mean by that? Like you got to have some realistic goals. Some people be like, look, I'm really not winning in my fitness goals. The good thing is like, what are your goals? Okay, what is your typical rate of gain? Some people have been training very hard, have been stagnant for years. I'm not going to 10x your gains. Like, well, if you're stagnant, technically 10x is zero gain still, right? Let's say they gain a pound of muscle every year and lose a pound of fat. I got nothing for you that's going to take that and go to 15 and 15. But maybe I got something to go to three and four, four and five. Maybe that's more realistic. So worth a conversation there. So if the main thing that holds people back in the gym is consistency, what holds people back outside of the gym? Sleep is a panacea for muscle growth and recovery and performance. Many people don't get enough sleep. Sometimes people get enough, almost everyone gets enough sleep on a monthly or even weekly calendar, because if you didn't, you would just degrade and die like battlefield exhaustion style. But a lot of people will be severely underslept by the end of the work week and they'll spend their weekends catching up on sleep. Now, catching up on sleep works in the sense that it, your body goes back to normal, but it doesn't cancel what happened to you before then. Um, so unfortunately, it, it doesn't get you back any of the muscle growth that you missed out. You know what I mean? It, it, it's, it's kind of like if you are a kid with the, the whole thing of Halloween candy, 
and you you know you're running really fast and the tree limb cuts your hand and you throw the candy off and run crying to your mom two blocks down she can heal your hand such that you're fine but you don't get your candy back because there's something interfered with the candy that it just can't take back and so catch up sleep works to get you normal again but if you look back and go hmm last six days i was sleeping four hours a day or typically need like seven I gained no muscle and actually gained a little bit of fat. But there's nothing we can do to reverse that process uh, and be like, okay, I'm getting that back. Like you, if you sleep 12 hours a night on Saturday, Sunday, you're not going to magically gain the muscle you were supposed to gain that week. It's over. That that time is over. So many people struggle with exactly that sort of situation where during the week they're underslept. And that means any amount of training stimulus and, and diet assistance they use is going to be like not falling on deaf ears, but damn near. One of my colleagues, Menno Henselmans, who's uh, an excellent contributor to the fitness space, he summarized a bit of research on exactly how bad it is sleep loss for muscle gain and fat burning. And like, look, man, I, I don't even, I don't even like talking about it in public because it scares people. It's a lot. It's a big difference. Like you can train hard and eat well and sleep well and gain muscle and lose fat at the same time. And if you still eat well and still train hard just the same, but you get like three hours too little sleep every night for a few nights, by the end of that process, on net, you've gained fat and lost muscle. It's not like it just takes your gains and losses and reduces them. It flips them in many cases. That is the thing. I, I like your your eyes widened for that. Well, because I'm like my sleep. Sometimes I'm like inconsistent with sleep. So I'm listening to that. and I'm like, God dang. So like if you were consulting me and you were a professional bodybuilder and you told me you were inconsistent with sleep and it was a private call and you you called me because you wanted a real talk and be like, the f is wrong with you you're a professional you can't miss sleep that's crazy it's like a finance executive on wall street missing board meetings it's not an option it's a must do and so a lot of people think oh i work out hard i don't get and you know you've you've heard this tone from people before no doubt they're like i work out real hard and i eat real well so my sleep's okay but that's not good enough and it could be the thing holding you back. The other thing is, of course, nutrition outside of the gym. Duh, not enough protein, not enough consistency of protein feedings. People say, I had a great breakfast, and then you know they're just getting to the fun part. Okay, how was lunch? Like, well, dinner was good too. And I'm like, how was lunch? And like, I had a cracker, and then I had to run out to a meeting. <laughs> amazing, amazing. <laughs> so you missed half your days of nutrition because you just didn't think things through. So nutrition's another big one, of course. And last one is total stress burden. If you're running around, chicken like had cut off, meetings and meetings and kids' soccer games and all this stuff, your chronic level of fight or flight hormones like cortisol is real high, and that just really blunts overall daily muscle growth. Whereas if your chronic levels of uh, less fight or flight hormone and you're more parasympathetic dominant, the part of your nervous system lets you recover and adapt and grow, if that's mostly how you feel all day, you'll just get way better results. To put a fine point on it, the Bulgarians, who won a way disproportionate higher number of Olympic medals in weightlifting back in the day, they would put their lifters, especially a few months before the Olympics, into an off-site training camp where they slept a full night's sleep. They trained hard as hell one or two, two times a day. All their meals were prepared for them completely nutritiously. And they napped twice a day and usually got two massages per day by a professional massage person. The part you don't read in the magazines is they also had sex workers there to make sure that the gentleman was fairly relieved, also several times a day. And that means like it's just paradise. You just all you do is either you are grinding the weights to a pulp or you are relaxing and being fed and have no other concerns in your life. That's how you get the best results. Of course, the rest of us can't do that. We all have day jobs, but you do have a choice and like do I have to do five extracurricular activities with my kids or can we do two and three? They like it better. I like it better. And then I'm not insane all the time falling behind on everything. And I can actually put my gym and nutrition and sleep into more of a useful situation where I do gain more muscle out of that process.